This is video 4 supporting the ITRC Soil Background and Risk Assessment Guidance document and describes geochemical evaluations and environmental forensics discussed in sections 5, 6, and 7. Geochemical evaluations and environmental forensics can be used when determining soil background and during risk assessment. These are powerful but advanced methods and should always be performed by qualified experts. Geochemical evaluations not only help determine soil background, but they also identify geochemical processes controlling concentrations in soil and identify potential sources. Geochemical evaluation is based in part on selected elemental ratios and considers all available data and information. Similarly, environmental forensics techniques consider the chemistry of organic compounds to interpret potential sources of contamination at a site. Both methods consider scientific, operational, and historical information to interpret the potential sources. The information provided by geochemical evaluations and environmental forensics can be used in support of risk assessment to determine whether concentrations are attributable to site impacts or are background, to select chemicals of potential concern, and during risk characterization. These are important considerations because remedial goals shouldn't be set below project-specific background values. When should geochemical evaluations and environmental forensics be considered during your project? Early in the project life cycle, such as when the conceptual site model and the data quality objectives are being developed. This is because these data evaluation techniques require specific sampling methods and specific lab analyses. Now let's take a closer look at geochemical evaluations and then we'll look at environmental forensics. Section 5 of the ITRC guidance document discusses geochemical evaluations and what to keep in mind during these evaluations, such as the different processes that control the element concentrations in your soil samples. Typically, the most important control is adsorption-desorption reactions on mineral surfaces. While data are visualized graphically, the evaluation isn't just a graphical technique. For example, be sure to study field observations, such as the soil descriptions from sample collection logs or drilling logs, and cite photographs. These other sources of information can provide additional lines of evidence to support conclusions based on elemental ratios. Adsorption can be illustrated by considering clay minerals, which are common in soil. They all contain aluminum as a primary component, and they tend to maintain net negative surface charges. Certain trace elements, such as cadmium, lead, and zinc, are often present as divalent cations, which are positively charged. The negatively charged clay mineral surfaces attract the positively charged element species. So elements like cadmium and lead can adsorb on the clays. Soils containing lots of clay minerals will have naturally higher concentrations of aluminum and associated trace elements. This association can be visualized using scatter plots of trace element versus major element concentrations, such as cadmium versus aluminum. During a geochemical evaluation, you may observe samples with elemental ratios that are unexpectedly different or anomalous compared to the ratios exhibited by other samples. An anomalous ratio may indicate that a sample contains more trace element than expected, based on the inferred soil mineral content. These anomalous ratios can indicate the presence of excess trace element from a contaminant source. Major element analyses, including aluminum, calcium, iron, magnesium, and manganese, are needed to properly evaluate trace elements of interest, such as arsenic, chromium, and lead. We are defining major elements as having concentrations greater than 100 mg per kilogram, and trace elements as having concentrations less than 100 mg per kilogram. The aluminum concentrations reported by the lab for a soil sample give a qualitative idea of the amount of clay minerals in the sample. Likewise, the iron concentrations indicate how much iron oxide minerals are in the sample, and manganese concentrations give a qualitative idea of the amount of manganese oxide minerals for oxic soils. So, don't forget to collect the right types of data and include major elements along with the trace elements. It's commonly assumed that background samples should be separated on the basis of soil types, location, depth, or other factors. However, geochemical evaluation can be used to test these assumptions and determine if data can be grouped. Also, statistical outliers are often identified in a set of possible or candidate background samples.
Geochemical evaluation can be used to determine whether statistical outliers represent contamination and should be removed from the candidate background data set, or whether these statistical outliers have a natural source or are due to inherent variability and should be retained. Here's a simple case study. A background study was performed at a facility where all new samples were collected just for background purposes. The candidate background data set included 61 surface soil samples and 277 subsurface soil samples. The project team wondered if these data could be pooled because during subsequent site investigations, the risk assessors would evaluate hypothetical receptors exposure to total or surface and subsurface soil. Also of interest was the highest cobalt concentration of 394 mg per kilogram, which was identified as a statistical outlier for the subsurface soil dataset. Should it be removed or retained? A geochemical evaluation was conducted to examine whether this outlier cobalt concentration had a natural source and was really part of the background population. Soils in this area contain lots of naturally occurring manganese oxide minerals. Manganese oxides have a strong affinity to adsorb specific trace elements, such as cobalt and barium. Here's a scatter plot of the data. The cobalt concentrations, which are plotted along the y-axis, are proportional to the corresponding manganese concentrations, which are plotted along the x-axis. The samples form a common trend with a positive slope. The sample with the highest cobalt also has the highest manganese, and it lies on the trend. This is the outlier cobalt concentration. All of the surface samples, the green circles, have similar cobalt versus manganese ratios as the subsurface samples. We know this because the samples all form a common trend, but there's another way to look at these data. It's easier to tell if the sample with the highest cobalt has a cobalt manganese ratio that's similar to the other ratios by actually calculating the ratios and then preparing a ratio plot. Here, the x-axis depicts cobalt versus manganese ratios instead of manganese concentrations. The ratio plot also lets us compare the surface ratios to the subsurface ratios. We can confirm that the ratios are similar. They span a narrow range. If a sample had cobalt contamination, then it would lie above the background trend in the scatter plot and to the right of the background samples in the ratio plot. But we don't see that, and the sample with the statistical outlier concentration has a cobalt-manganese ratio that lies within the narrow range. If other elements also exhibit similarity in elemental ratios regardless of depth, then that suggests there's no need to keep the surface and subsurface soil data separate all of the time. For this facility, after evaluating other elements in soil, the project team decided that it was appropriate to combine the surface and subsurface soil background data sets in addition to having separate data sets. Summary and inferential statistics were then calculated for the three background data sets. Let's look at a few more examples of other trace element evaluations, also using real-world soil data sets. Chromium concentrations in soil at this site were determined to be naturally occurring. Note that all of the site sample's chromium iron ratios are similar to those of the site-specific background samples. At this site, one sample has an anomalously high copper iron ratio. This sample doesn't have the highest copper concentration, but it still may be impacted by copper contamination, and it has more copper than expected based on its iron oxide content. And at this site, three samples have anomalously high zinc-aluminum ratios that exceed the range of background zinc-aluminum ratios. Zinc contamination is suspected for these three samples. Let's move on to environmental forensics. Forensics evokes an image of TV crime shows. Just like in these shows, environmental forensics is the science of putting together different pieces of information from a site to try to understand what happened here. It is a large and diverse topic. Section 7 of the ITRC guidance presents a brief introduction to environmental forensics as it applies to soil background and risk assessment. Environmental forensics can provide a line of evidence to support whether certain organic chemicals represent background, generally anthropogenic, or are site-related. For background and risk assessment purposes, Environmental forensics is generally applied to groups of chemical compounds that are broadly similar, but with subtle differences 
that result in different chemical properties and source characteristics. Examples include PAHs, PCBs, dioxins and furans, and PFAS. These are all discussed in Section 7 of the guidance document. Considering natural or anthropogenic background for these chemical groups can be important because they are widespread and persistent in the environment. PAHs are a class of chemicals that occur naturally in coal, oil, and gasoline, and which are also produced when those chemicals are burned. They're widespread and persistent in the environment and have high toxicity, and therefore it's frequently necessary to distinguish site PAHs from background using environmental forensics techniques. Shown here are examples of PAH pairs that are isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but slightly different structures, and therefore chemical behaviors. And because of this, their relative abundances can be used as a line of evidence to distinguish sources. The bolded isomers are the more stable of the pair and tend to be enriched during slow cooling, for example, during petrogenesis. The bottom pair have four rings and are considered high molecular weight PAHs, while the top pair with three rings are considered low molecular weight PAHs. High molecular weight PAHs are generally formed in relatively higher concentrations by combustion at high temperatures. In contrast, petroleum generally contains relatively higher concentrations of low molecular weight PAHs. PAHs can have alkyl groups such as methyl groups shown here attached to the rings. The alkyl PAHs are generally not included in standard 8270 analyses. However, some labs are able to report groups of alkyl PAHs if requested in advance. These are known as alkyl homolog groups and can be quite useful in sleuthing out sources of PAHs. Shown here are 1-methylnaphthalene and 2-methylnaphthalene. They are unusual for alkyl PAHs in that they are included in the standard 80-70 analyses. However, they are also part of a C1 homolog group of naphthalene because they both have one alkyl carbon attached to the PAH rings. PAHs with alkyl groups are generally less stable at high temperatures than the parent PAHs without the alkyl groups. Overall, these relative stabilities mean that the ratios of various PAHs or groups of PAHs to each other can be used as a line of evidence to distinguish sources, including a background source. PAHs have petrogenic sources and pyrogenic sources. Petrogenic PAHs, formed at moderate temperature over geologic time, such as petroleum. Pyrogenic PAHs, formed as a result of incomplete high temperature combustion over short periods of time. A petrogenic source is typically characterized by a bell shape in alkyl homolog groups, as shown here, and relatively low abundance of the less stable of the isomer pairs. C1, C2, C3, and C4, shown here, represent increasing degrees of alkylation, 1 to 4 carbons, with C0 and P0 over here being the parent compounds chrysine and phenanthrene. A pyrogenic signature is typically characterized by a skewed shape in the alkyl homolog groups, as shown here and higher relative abundances of the less stable of the isomer pairs. With these general principles in mind, PAH data can be visualized in several ways. The guidance describes four different visualization techniques used in application of environmental forensics during background evaluations. These are diagnostic ratios, pattern recognition, spatial temporal analyses, and quantitative source apportionment the most common of which is principal component analysis. The best visualization technique will depend on the situation. Influences of other factors, for example, weathering, need to be considered, and environmental forensics should be performed by a qualified expert with experience in the field. The table and graph shown here present some diagnostic ratios that have been used to distinguish PAH sources. The graph is from a PAH background study of Milwaukee Parks. The authors used the similarity of PAH ratios in parks from across the city to identify anthropogenic ambient background PAH concentrations, and in turn, used the results to adjust screening criteria for PAHs to account for urban background. Another technique 
is pattern recognition. In this figure, PAHs are ordered by molecular weight and samples representing two different sources are shown. The dark blue bars are parent PAHs. The light blue bars are alkylated PAHs. The light blue bars occur in groups representing the degree of alkylation of the adjacent parent. The patterns show that road asphalt has a greater relative abundance of alkylated PAHs and shows the characteristic bell shape of the alkyl homolog groups. This is the characteristic petrogenic signature, which makes sense for road asphalt. Urban dust has lower absolute concentrations, a greater relative abundance of the parent PAHs, and higher relative concentrations of high molecular weight PAHs. This also shows the characteristic skewed shape of the alkyl homolog groups. This is a characteristic pyrogenic signature. In this example, urban dust represents background and asphalt is of interest. The signatures are a line of evidence in distinguishing between the two. A third technique described in the guidance is spatial temporal analysis. Consider a site where four ring PAHs with a characteristic pyrogenic signature occur over a broad area and at depth, while two to three ring PAHs with a characteristic petrogenic signature occur in a localized area near a more recent petroleum terminal and closer to the surface. This observation is consistent with the known history of the site outlined in this cartoon. In this case, the four to six ring PAHs are considered anthropogenic regional background. Site cleanup is focused on the two to three ring PAHs localized at the terminal property. Finally, the guidance describes quantitative source apportionment techniques, such as principal component analysis, or PCA. PCA is a mathematical method that transforms a large number of possibly correlated variables into a smaller number of uncorrelated variables called principal components. The principal components are ranked by the amount of variance they explain. Factor score plots, shown here on the left, are visual projections of the PCA. This plot shows the principal component that explains the most variance on the x-axis, that is PC1, and the second strongest principal component on the y-axis, PC2. In these graphs, factor scores that plot close to one another share similar chemical compositions, and factor scores that plot far apart have different chemical compositions. Looking at more detail at the diagram, it shows both pH patterns on the right, in this case, parent pH is only with no alcohol pH is included, and a graph of PCA factor scores for 350 sediment samples on the left. Pattern A represents moderately weathered creosote and is characterized by relatively abundant low molecular weight pHs, the gray bars. Pattern B is a more severely weathered creosote showing loss of the lightest pHs on the left and relatively higher abundance of the high molecular weight PAHs, the black bars, to the right. Pattern C is consistent with combustion sourced urban background. This PCA factor score plot shows that most samples appear as mixtures of weathered creosote and urban anthropogenic ambient background, and the relative amounts can be assigned quantitatively. Geochemical evaluation and environmental forensics are powerful methods in soil background and risk analysis. They require specific chemical analyses and should be considered during the initial stages of project planning in consultation with qualified experts. For more information on geochemical evaluation and environmental forensics, see sections 5, 6, 7, and 14 of the ITRC Soil Background and Risk Assessment document at itrcweb.org. The Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council is a nonprofit research program of the Environmental Council of the States. ITRC is a state led organization composed of over 1,000 members from state agencies, federal government, tribal and international organizations, the private sector, academia, and community stakeholders. Members participate in technical teams which produce guidance, tools, resources, and training materials. If you'd like to be a part of ITRC, please visit the ITRC website at itrcweb.org. You can register for Teams and learn more about how you can be an active member.
ITRC's usage policy is available on the ITRC website. If you do plan to use ITRC materials, we ask that you review that policy in detail and be sure to credit ITRC. ITRC does not warranty the material nor endorse any specific products.